Hello, everyone, and welcome to panel discussion, OhioLink Accessibility Local Implementation. Sharing this information with you is Kim Fleshman from Bowling Green State University, Terry Green from the University of Toledo, Tim Watson from The Ohio State University, Cindy Kristoff from Kent State University, Natalie Cohen from Case Western uh, Reserve University, and myself. My name is Emily Flynn. I'm with OhioLink, and I will be your moderator for the next 50 minutes or so. A quick reminder before we begin, during the presentation portion, please keep your audio and video muted and turned off unless you are presenting or you're asked to participate by the moderator. You may use the chat tab to ask questions, which will be addressed during the Q&A portion. Thank you for joining us and we'll get started with this panel. I'm also gonna post that in the chat, here we go. Ohio Schools and Accessibility, Policies, Implementations, issues, exceptions, and our community of schools. So I'm gonna first give a brief overview of the OhioLink ETD Center. OhioLink is a consortium of academic libraries and the State Library of Ohio. We have about 117 member libraries and 36 of which participate in the OhioLink ETD Center. It is a shared open access consortial submission platform and repository. So we have a back end for submission and a front end website that shows the published ones where people can search and download and, and use the ETDs. We have nearly 120,000 ETDs currently, and there's the link on the slides. These are available in um, the US ETDA webpage or will be shortly after the conference. It is a locally developed platform and digital accessibility has been incorporated into it within the last couple of years. The uh, digital accessibility became a consortial priority in addition to meeting compliance. They also, uh, we developed local policies and had lots of discussions with the OhioLink ETD Council. They're our advisory committee between our ETD community members and our OhioLink office. It took about two years of planning and preparation, and that included community presentations and feedback. Originally, we had a year deadline, but that got shifted a couple of times, so it was about two years out from when we initially started talking about digital accessibility and incorporating that into the process. The OhioLink ETD Center had a major revision, 3.0 release in the summer of 2022. And because of that, we also had some additional local compliance to make our content digitally accessible, which um, is where this also um, stemmed from. So submission requirements for ETD PDFs uploaded to the platform began after January 31st, 2023. And our ETD Center is highly customizable. Uh, and so each institution sets their own local policies and workflows, like with any other field or piece of information that they have their students submit. So now we're going to hear from each of our panelists for their school policies. And then after that, on the consecutive slides, we have some general topics and lots of points to share. So a few of our panelists will speak to each to pull out their key pieces of advice or stories, and then we'll try to save lots of time at the end for questions and also opening the discussion with all of you. So without further ado, uh, Kim, do you wanna start off with BGSU's policy? Um, yes, I have hyperlinked the policies on the PDF version of this that people can download from the USCTDA. Um, our policy is dense <laughs> and extremely long, so I certainly don't want to read it 
out loud to anyone. Um, but we also have a several stakeholders that were involved in developing it, our accessibility services office, our IT department, general counsel, um, and uh, student affairs was also involved in creating this policy. Do you want me to just point out a few of the things that we're saying we have to do? I mean, we have a whole list on our website and I could, in when I stop sharing, I could include that into the chat because our minimum digital accessibility standards are slightly stronger than what Ohio Link was requiring of us. So being it, it's a longer list, I'll just include a link in the chat. Sounds good. Uh, Natalie, if you're on, do you wanna talk about Case Western's policy? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are just the opposite than what Kim just described. We went with the bare minimum. Um, I, when we posted this information, this new policy out to our students and faculty, we received quite a bit of pushback. So we kind of wanted to slow walk this process um, so again, our, our uh, minimum standards are actually minimum standards as we are required to have by Ohio Link. Um, we only have really only five points, uh, mainly making sure that students um, can include their alt text with all of their figures and images. Um, but the the majority of our standards are, are pretty minimum. Um, the ability for our students to ensure that they meet these policies, that process is, is very simple for them. Um, and we wanted to do that, like I said, because we got a ton of pushback from our faculty and students when we first put out that this was a policy that was going to be coming forward. Um, we Our uh, requirements are that students uh, must their file needs to include full text, the accessibility permission flag must be checked, um, and their language must be specified as well. And they need to have titles and headings for all of the major sections of their documents. So like I said, we, we kept it real simple. Natalie, uh, Cindy, you wanna talk about Kent State's policy? Yeah, so at Kent State, we did just like Natalie did and unlike what Kim did, and we kept it to the, the bare minimum too. We figured this would be a good way to ease in, into it. Um, Kent State does have its policy and its policy register. So when you see that hyperlink that says Kent State policy, that links to our legalese, <laughs> which, you know, was you can you can go and read it it's great <laughs> but it's not something that i was personally involved in this was really between um the university council and uh it and so it had a hand in that they worked this out and then the uh the etd portion came later maybe about a year or two later so the link to libraries that's on there is actually the page that we give to students and i'm the etd administrator for ohio link but i don't have the most contact with students what we had to do is kind of um get the uh what we call gatekeepers comfortable with this so we have a gatekeeper it, it doesn't sound like a bad gatekeeper it doesn't it's not bad it's an etd contact for each college um within kent state university so one person is assigned um that person is um part of the uh, dean's office of that college and uh, they're charged with, well, among other things, like ETT is just a, a side job to them. They've got a lot of other duties there too, but they work with the students getting their uh, paperwork. Um, when students want to graduate, um, they handle applications. They're in charge of uh, distributing the style guides uh, for the different colleges. And then they're uh, charged with uh, checking over the ETDs to make sure that they meet those standards. So what we had to do at Kent State was get those folks comfortable with the idea of accessibility and how are we gonna do this? So we had to put a lot of people involved there. And I would say all the gatekeepers are distinct personalities. They all do things a little 
little bit differently. The colleges do things differently. A couple of colleges don't even have their own style guide. Um, so it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, so what I tried to do was meet with the gatekeepers and get them introduced to this this idea. So I worked with Allison Haynes, who is in IT and um, in charge of compliance and her staff on uh, putting together a tip sheet. So their staff put together a tip sheet with the screenshots that um, you can just kind of look at and go through. And then I built a tutorial video in my voice and <laughs> it's on there and uh, it just kind of brings the tip sheet to video format so people can look at that and follow along and it seems to have worked. Um, the information technology link that's on there is just a huge introduction to everything that we've done for accessibility and we have a general DEIA um, endeavor at Kent State that's pretty strong. Um, we have a university um, council for it. I'm serving on that this year. Um, so it's been an emphasis at Kent State University, the idea of inclusion, accessibility, um, diversity. Um, so that's been the good part. Um, so one thing I noticed with students is when they had questions about accessibility, they had questions that kind of went almost the other direction. Like we've got those minimum standards and a lot of students wanted to make it more than that, which I think is kind of a good sign for when we do increase the standards. We do intend to do that at some point. Um, so yeah, that's the basic story at Kent State. Cindy? Kim, would you talk about OSU's policy? Yes, thanks, Emily. Hi, everybody. Glad to be here. Um, at OSU, um, we really went to the direction of developing our, our own ETD policy outside of what the Ohio State MDAS is and, and so forth based on that, but, um, but felt the need to really develop our own uh, ETD policy for accessibility and this really focused on one, I'll say, is some of the others here, the, the, the kind of the minimum standards um, that we felt that, that, you know, would get us off to a good start. And, um, and really what I did is I, I looked at the formatting or had a, a person look at our formatting template. And I said, what does this do well in terms of accessibility? And so I modeled the what we were going to record or what we were going to suggest that students do based on what our formatting template uh, already did pretty well. And so that was a, a pretty good start. But really what the, the policy that we developed focused on on a couple of things, which is a theme that I think we we keep hearing. Right. Um, one, I'll give Lily a shout out from Iowa State. She said this at a meeting one time, and I thought this was was very uh, pertinent that. The key to this right now, where we're at, is education. Uh, we we need to get the word out to the campus, and with our volume, uh, you know, to to lay this on to students to say, "Hey, you're graduating this semester, but you know what? You're going to have to apply accessibility to this whole thing. Um, you've got 175 figures that need alt text. <clears throat> Good luck." Um, you know, we we were not in a you know. Uh, position to do that. Uh, we needed to we need to roll this out over a period of time. So the education is important, and then the uh, again the uh, getting the uh, assistance right, getting stakeholders in this. Uh, it's been slow going here. Um, we would think at a place like OSU that it, it would not necessarily be that hard, but at the same time, there's you know people have their own areas right and. Um, so we've had a hard time kind of developing uh, uh, stakeholders and, you know, it's just a, a real continual process here with this. And um, so that's kind of where we were at with this policy. That's why I wrote it so that it really focused on those two things. And that over the next couple of years, you know, this is what we're focusing on. Um, we made a declaration that, that, that no student would not be allowed to graduate because they could not meet accessibility. We are asking them to do the best that they can at this point with the available resources that are out there. So that's really the the focus that we had, and um, you know we're going to keep keep on that path, and and eventually we will get to a point um, certainly where we'll start requiring more, and and that that people will need to have this in order to graduate. I will say one thing, uh, and this probably will come up as an as a hurdle. I don't want to go too deep here, but. Um, 
you know, we have basically by the dissertation deadline, dissertation and thesis deadline, we have three days, three working days after that to get the graduation list set. Uh, Ohio State gives out live diplomas at commencement, so people have to be graduated. So uh, we have very little time uh, to go back and check these documents. This is a, a real hurdle that we will have to get through. But anyway, I'll, I'll leave it off there, and I'm sure we'll talk more about all that later. Thanks, Kim. And Terry, you want to talk about UT's policy? Yes, you'll notice there is no hyperlink. That is because we do not have a formal developed uh, MDAS yet. Um, so um, our approach is to um, follow what the Ohio Link EDD minimum standards are. I think there's five of them. Um, but our challenge in even creating a policy is it trying to get the stakeholders to even stay in their position long enough to support the process. As an example, our acting dean and interim VP for academic affairs was just promoted to interim provost. And so that was um, about four days ago. Um, and so, you know, I've reached out to um, other campus partners, um, especially, for example, um, Office of um, Accessibility and Disability Resources. Um, and so our director and chief compliance officer has been instrumental in helping to craft the policy. Um, but then when we were ready to move forward, our acting dean at the time said, well, maybe we should run this by grad council first because they're gonna be reviewing existing policies. And, um, and so here we are, right? Just kind of spinning and spinning. So um, we have done other things, even though it's not a formalized stated policy um, in terms of trying to provide tools and support for students to at least be able to begin the process of checking and fixing their own work. Um, uh, we've also, you know, integrated um, accessibility into our word templates. Um, but again, as someone else mentioned, it's a lot of it is just educating, right? And so um, in a way, developing the policy for us right now is kind of putting the cart before the horse. Um, so we want to make sure that when the policy is enacted, that the students will be educated and will have access to the tools that they need to carry out those minimum standards. Um, so that's all I kind of want to say on that at this point. So um, Learn from, I, I don't know, work somewhere where people stay in their jobs longer than six months. That's my suggestion <laughs> for moving through a bureaucratic system. So thanks, Terry. Yep. <laughs> so now we're going to roll into our topical slides. We're going to start first with implementation, and we have lots of bullets. The two main ones are the tools and software used, as well as workflows and procedures. So I'm going to open this up to any panelist that wants to share a piece of information or advice or um, any stories for this one. So I think I just want to start off and talk about Acrobat and just the general expense of it. And I think that we were hoping, Allison and I, Allison from IT uh, Compliance, and I were hoping that they would pay for an enterprise-wide license so everybody could just have it, and that would be lovely. But we didn't have that. Um, we can get it as staff uh, if needed, but we have to justify that we need Adobe Acrobat Pro. <laughs> um, students can get it for a discounted price, and that license, I think, lasts for a year. Um, and it's not bad. Um, I think the trouble is, is $100 can be a lot for some students. I think that's what it is now. Um, yes, they can get the free one, but if they get the trial and they don't keep the trial long enough and then they have to make some corrections that require them to go back and use Adobe again, that's problematic. So I really, I mean, this is a universal problem. It's not just a Kent State problem, but it was a big 
sticking point for me and I had to try to make sure that students knew what their options were. I'll just add to that, um, you know, one thing that OSU does have, I talked about, you know, identifying stakeholders and having, you know, that's been kind of a slow, slow process. But one good thing we do have is Acrobat Pro is free to all students and staff at Ohio State. So that is fantastic. Um, so we have put together a guide um, that um, addresses the, the uh, guidelines, the accessibility guidelines that we have and uh, does walk them part of the way through that in, in terms of how to get the Acrobat Pro uh, from the university and, and then use that for the accessibility checker and the report and so forth. Uh, so that's a big plus. I know that, as Cindy said, I know that's a real hurdle for a lot of people. And uh, so that that's one where area that that actually we're, we uh, have a little bit of an advantage, I would say. Yes, here at BGSU, actually, the CEO of Adobe went to school here, and we don't even get that deal. <laughs> so um, we do have Acrobat available on university machines and in um, our open labs. We only have, we have several labs for class purposes. We only have two always kind of open labs, one's in the library, one's in our, um, um, the student union. So, but if a student is trying to do this from a distance, they're probably, in our case, going to get stuck with the $19.99 per month. But generally, students only have to pay for one month, and our university has taken the opinion that that is the cheapest textbook they will buy. So, we put that back on the student. I'd like to add that at, um, at Toledo, um, in exploring, because they changed, we used to all have access. We had an enterprise license, and then several years ago that went away. Um, and then it was still available to staff and faculty. And then several years later, that went away, and you pretty much have to justify with every fiber of your being why you need access, you know, or why you need a user license uh, for Ac Acrobat Pro. Um, and so, we don't offer it in our virtual labs. We don't offer it in our libraries. We don't offer it in our writing center. Um, and so I went ahead and we scrounged up um, several desktops and we purchased local licenses for those desktops. And we are converting our office into a mini writing studio, if you will. And so students can come in, hop right on, and they will have access to Acrobat Pro. Um, and so that's in its infancy. Um, but again, the, these are just one of the measures, you know, that we're taking to try and offer the the right tools, you know, for, for the job. So um, yeah, that's what we're doing. <laughs> Same here at Case. Um, ironically, we offered it free to students at one point, and then at the end of 2022, they took that away just in time for us to implement this new policy. Uh, so I, I'm pretty sure that's one of the major reasons why we got so much pushback from our students, because they're like, now we have to pay this fee for a program that we once had for free, and now we have this lovely requirement that we're faced with. Um, somehow, some way, our students have kind of found a way around it. Um, they have, I, I know students that have gotten together as a group and they've scheduled a time to just sit down and they do their seven day free trial and they all go through their accessibility process together. And then everybody submits their ETD at the same time. Um, it's uh, it was a huge hurdle in the beginning, but somehow, some way, our students have they've they found a way to get over that. Uh, we as staff have also had to submit a rationale as to why we need to use um, Acrobat Pro, uh, which was another headache as well. But I mean, we we just did what we had to do to make sure we were able to service our students. Um, I primarily work with students that are in engineering and science programs, so they use LaTeX a lot, um, and uh, the accessibility process through Acrobat was 
it, it was it was better for them than using any other program. So when we implemented our process and this policy, we strongly advise that they use um, that process to go through their accessibility checker. Um, but unfortunately, uh, we still, you know, we have those students that still complain about having to pay that fee or they're scared to go through a seven day trial because they know that they're going to forget and they're going to get charged. So it's it's been a hurdle, but we've we've done our best to try to find a workaround. Excellent. Thank you, Natalie. Let's move on to the next topic we have. Some more implementation. This one is about training, and we've broken it out into ourselves and our students. We've touched upon this just a little bit um, already, but if anyone has anything else to add quickly, and then we can move on to the next section. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just say real quick, it, it kind of ties to the, the first slide there too, the, the, uh, the format reviews by the staff, right? Um, that has been, um, you know, I have a great staff, but they have come to me and said, you know, that, that this accessibility stuff has really added, you know, quite a bit uh, to the format review process, not only just in, in doing the accessibility check, but relaying this back to the student and then the student writing us, you know, with questions. Um, you know, we're not accessibility coordinators, so, you know, and we're still learning, so we're kind of limited, but it, it definitely is a uh, you know, um, going to impact the time related to these format reviews. So we're trying to, you know, figure out a way to, to do this a little bit more efficiently. But, but that certainly is one, uh, you know, one factor. Um, I'll jump in and just say one thing that we like to emphasize when we're training our students is that if they know how to make a document accessible, that's a valuable addition to their next workplace. Yes. And it could add salary dollars to their salary and um so yeah students have taken to it pretty well which I, i'm really grateful for i just want to add that i know certain schools will fix things for the student and other schools put it all back on the student um here at bgsu depending on the number of fixes and how much time it would take us to do it versus explaining everything that's wrong and having them do it is a deciding factor that we weigh out before we choose to fix something. Of course, when we're talking about fixes, we're talking about accessibility and not a uh, something that would affect the uh, written portion of the document. It's not going to change their content in that kind of way. It's just making it easier for the public to view. Great point. Thank you, Kim. Let's move on to the next slide. And can everyone make sure they're muted if they're not uh, presenting? Thank you. So we'll move on to issues. And here we have not enough resources, which is a major one with lots of little sub bullets, and then documents, that cannot be made 100% accessible. And I know Cindy has a great um, way to talk about this. So maybe she can jump in on that one. And then we also called out relative short timeline to get policy and procedures established. A couple people have brought this up. And then as Terry said, they've started at UT, but the policy isn't quite there yet, but she's working on it with the students already. Okay, Emily, I will jump in. Um, and again, say not enough resources. Yeah, we don't have enough resources because we don't have what Tim has at Ohio State with the uh, Adobe Acrobat. I'm really envious and it's stewing a little bit right here, I got to tell you. Okay, but with regard to the fact that documents cannot be made 100% accessible, I almost think about it in a, in a metaphysical way. Um, I, in my talks with Allison, which we had plenty, we talked about the fact that you can't make a document 100% accessible because you can't make a document have sight for a student that um, has uh, sight issues, for example. You can't make somebody hear music that cannot hear. So it only goes so far. Um, and even if it could go farther, it, it would involve this 
I'm getting very metaphysical here, this dramatic change in, you know, the way like almost a, like a cochlear implant would be, a, you know, but a, an accessible document cannot do that. So what we try is our best effort. And we are very, very willing to um, help anybody along that has any difficulties with any of our documents uh, with remediation. We're ready to take that on and to help whoever comes along. Carrie or Natalie, do you have anything to add? Sure. Um, we were very surprised when we first implemented this policy of the lack of resources available to our students on campus. Um, in deep conversations with our, um, our technology office, as well as our libraries, we found that they had the same issue we did. And it was just they didn't have the manpower to really put out to the students that they were an available resource for them uh, going through this process, uh, which initially it was a bit of a headache starting out. Um, we expected to kind of be welcomed with open arms and it was the exact opposite. Um, after many conversations with those offices, we 100% understood that the amount of graduate students that we have compared to the amount of staff that they had, uh, it just, it, it was a bad ratio. And so while they did offer some assistance to our students, when they saw that word was getting out and more students were then leaning on their offices, it, it, they circled back to us. Like, we got to find a way around this. How How can we assure that the students are meeting this policy that the university is providing them with the necessary resources to adhere to this policy and that we all don't walk away from our jobs because it's just entirely too much. Um, I work in the graduate office, so myself and one other individual assists with the, uh, the formatting reviews. And so trying to walk a student through how to make their document accessible was very lengthy, very time consuming. Um, we did have some chances where we met with a group of faculty where we tried to walk them through what best practices would be. Um, and then they were able to disseminate that information to their students. And so over the course of a couple months, we kind of started seeing students being able to do this on their own. Um, and now that we're almost halfway year in, um, it the load has lightened quite a bit. So uh, I guess my my suggestion um, to anybody that's still trying to work through this process is you just got to give it time. Um, word will spread. That game of telephone will happen, and the students will start leaning on one another, um, opposed to leaning on us. <laughs> hopefully. So yeah, um, luckily we we are above water at this point. Thanks, Natalie. That's great to hear. And I love that the students are coming together and helping each other out. Um, I remember that at grad school too, we would put on like little um, talks that we did ourselves and people would come to our lounge and, you know, be more comfortable with, with helping each other. So we'll move on to the second uh, slide with issues. This time we have clarity and agreement on accessibility standards, time, of course, various needs, and do students not graduate if a document is not accessible? And Tim already addressed this for OSU and he said, no, at this point, um, they won't hold people back because of that. So if anyone else from the panel wants to jump in on these topics, we'd love to hear more. Yeah, I'd I like, oh, go oh, ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I've been jumping in a lot. <laughs> um, I'd just like to say that if you go to section508.gov's website, you'll find um, a couple of exceptions that are allowed for why something is not accessible. And BGSU has chosen because of um, our uh, scores for music and many issues that happen with LaTeX documentation to come up with wording that we put on our copy on the copyright page of the student's PDF as to why it may not be 
meeting our minimum digital accessibility standards. Um, for those who are geeking out, it's um, E202.6 and E202.7 <laughs> that we use to get out of uh, those um, two issues. So if you if you care, uh, the one says this content is unable to be made fully accessible because it would result in a fundamental alteration of the document. And the other one says this content is unable to be made fully accessible due to the music notation in the score. Conformance to the minimum accessibility standards could not be achieved due to the non-availability of technology that fully conforms to the standards. So, and that's taking that right off of their website. Kim, I'm wondering what um, what prompted you to you know institute or implement this you know uh, wording in their document. I mean, did someone complain or 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 <laughs> was there fear of being held legally liable? Well, first it started with the legality, and then it became there is no way I can take a music score and put every single treble clef and bass clef and quarter note and eighth note and colon or you know repeat and <laughs> all of that every time you uh, yeah there's unless you unless you read music to understand that the number of things every time there's a forte or um, a crescendo it's just insane and it it is making thousands of things come up in character encoding as a problem um and so that's when you get a chance, can you drop that page into chat? Uh, sure, I will do that. For those references to the yes. exceptions. Thank you. Uh-huh. Cindy, did you want to talk about this um, topic as well? Well, Kim did a great job, but I guess I'll answer the question, um, do students not graduate if a document is not accessible? And the answer to that is that they make their best effort to make that document accessible. And a good faith effort, I think, goes a long way. Um, we do let them graduate. Um, and if there's remediation that we've got to do, then we'll handle that task when it comes along. But most students have um, been able to do this with... I, I've been really happy about that. Um, it's gone pretty well. And that's the same for Case. We will not hold back a student's graduation uh, due to this new policy. Um, the same, we will continue to work with them as best as possible to get it to the minimum standards that we've set for the school. Um, but no, we, we will not hold back a student's graduation for this. I'd like to weigh in on this as well. Um, prior to accessibility standards, of course, we had formatting standards. And um, the last day for students to submit um, is the last day of the term. Um, and so we have up to 30 days to clear everyone for graduation. So the only thing really that we would ever hold back on is the actual public release of their document. Um, we would never, it, we would never, you know, hold up on graduation. Um, and we would not, when we get accessibility standards implemented, it will be regarded the same as, as formatting, um, you know, where they will still have an opportunity to remediate or make additional, you know, improvements to their document and they still get to graduate. Um, it's just literally going to affect, you know, how fast we can um, publicly release their document if they don't already have it embargoed. Yes, we don't give out live diplomas like OSU does. Um, so we have, we tell students it takes five to six weeks to get them cleared. Um, they get an email that lets them know when it is proved and cleared. Generally, we try to do that before our deadline and our deadline is usually about four weeks before graduation, but not with the number that we can get in a spring or summer semester. It takes that extra time. Thanks everyone. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, John mentioned something about potentially extra time. So we'll, we'll see um, we need at the end. I know we're getting through them, so 
expectations. So importance of the final product. And I know we've been touching on this a little bit already. So if anyone has anything to add. Yeah, just to say, uh, you know, again, this is where the education comes in, right? Um, you know, we're still in this, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're still kind of, um, you know, in the the area where we're notifying students. You know, I send the students and when they apply to graduate, you know, in the last few semesters, I've sent them a specific notice about accessibility and, um, you know, what the expectations were. Um, but at the same time, you know, this is something that needs to be worked in. And um, um, it has to start really from when the students be begin on campus. And I made a, a mention in the chat that you know, we're thinking about adding uh, accessibility training uh, to students when they are admitted to the university, that this will be on their checklist that they will have to complete. And, uh, you know, it's a good way, you know, we keep it short, of course, and so forth. But at the same time, it introduces to these students right off that this is important. And this is something that they're going to have to uh, pay attention to and incorporate into their work uh, in getting this, as much like the formatting. You know, I see you can't, don't expect to do the formatting the night before you need to, to turn your document in. Uh, you need to work it in and, and certainly the same with accessibility. So, um, yeah, so we just need to, you know, get that as, as change says, changing the culture, right? This needs to become a standard that 10 years from now, we won't even be talking about this as much. It'll just be just like formatting always was, right? It's just, it's just, it just is. Yeah, I think we've had those discussions too, where, you know, remember when um, board processing was new and now we all do it and it's not a big deal. Most of us do basic spreadsheets. You know, I expect that it's it's going to get to that point. It's going to be part of the culture, part of what everybody does. Um, I hope to see it go there. I too agree. And I saw something about this in the chat, actually. And what I was thinking is I like the idea of it being up front for the grad students. Most of our graduate students end up teaching assistants anyways. And so they should know how to remediate a Word document, a PowerPoint, and a PDF if they're going to put it up in Blackboard, Canvas, or whatever your, you know, learning management system is, because students in their class are going to need that. Excellent, thank you. So we also have some additional exceptions for LaTeX and musical scores, which we've touched on due to their formatting. They're particularly tough and tricky sometimes to uh, make digitally accessible, non-traditional ETDs and supplemental files. Right now, OhioLink is only requiring the PDF document of the ETD uh, the text itself, any supplemental files are still as is for now. And then we have community. So sharing resources, meeting with other schools via Zoom. Uh, I know there's also other ways to talk or on the phone. Um, people have been very helpful and also on sessions already today saying that they'll be available as people need. Keeping in mind that we are all learning together and trying to use that core knowledge together. Looking for groups, so US ETDA, our own OhioLink ETD Advisory Council, OhioLink Accessibility Task Force and Working Group, which is another group we have. And then there's also the US ETDA Formatting Users Group, Dynamic Documents and Guide from OhioLink. I can share some resources here in the chat and then any other divisions within your own school. So if any of the panelists would like to give any further advice or information, please jump in. I say lean on one another. Um, in the beginning of this process, both Kim and Tim were a huge resource for us at CASE. Um, I believe we met with Kim via Zoom, myself and a couple staff members um, in our office. And she is a world of information over there. Um, I don't, I, I don't want to put it out there so everybody goes and runs to the two of them. <laughs> but 
I, I my suggestion lean on one another um, because you, you'd be surprised the the level of information that one of your colleagues has as it relates to this process uh, because the the individuals on this panel have been good uh, have been great I pulled some great information from them throughout this almost this past year so I say lean on one another. So I'm going to say that too, that Kim, I've studied your work like a creepy stalker and I admire everything you've done. So that's been a huge help, although I did not meet with you. Um, <laughs> I kept that all very quiet, didn't I? But there's another thing I wanted to point out that we do locally at Kent State. We have what's called an Equal Access Academy. So that covers like a lot of ac aspects of DEIA. And this is a schedule of our events and it's everything from like, what is neurodiversity to, you know, making your document accessible. Uh, it goes through all these different sorts of aspects of uh, DEIA. And I'm really proud that Kent State has done this. We have a big emphasis on belonging. We have a big sign on our library that says you belong here. And I read that every morning and I'm like, yeah, I belonged here about 15 minutes ago. I realize I'm running late, but no, I really, um, the, the emphasis on belonging, I think, has become part of our culture where we welcome people and um, we want to make it a good experience for them. And I think that is a little bit contagious. I mean, not to be too Pollyanna, but I think it's it's done a good job for us. And I'll just, you know, put props out there for Terry Green because she is fantastic with Microsoft Word. And a lot of that can hold into the PDF as long as you don't auto tag it um, to if you're going from Word to PDF, you know, your alt text should be there and things like that. Your headings should be there and it helps uh, just make it go a lot faster when you go to check it in the end if your student already has that in the template. I'd like to just first thank you, Kim, um, for the kudos. I appreciate that. Um, I think, you know, as we've gone through these slides, you know, there's been a little bit of not venting, but just like, hey, these are the challenges or these are, you know, the stumbling blocks. But it's been really great to hear about when things are unexpectedly better than we had anticipated. And I think that having a passion for this work and having a passion for your students, um, I think moving forward, you know, if someone has had something go really well, right? Like like this equal access website or whatever it is, you know, that we can be sharing that kind of as a Templar, you know, to follow. And um, yeah, so that maybe, because I, I think when you're starting out and you're trying to figure out policy and, and who does what, um, even even hearing from other schools or looking into what they're doing, it doesn't necessarily give you a clear roadmap. I think at times you feel like you're still just gathering information and cobbling things together. So I would like to see our communities of practice um, also be really, you know, forthright in, in sharing kind of the easiest path forward or the most successful, if that makes sense. I'm just kind of speaking off the cuff here, but that was just, you know, I, I, a couple slides back, you know, we talked about a culture change, right? And so um, I, I think we can all contribute to changing the culture. So I'm really proud to be associated with this group, by the way. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Terry. That rolls into goals quite nicely, I think. So the goals we have listed here, and these are just a few, I'm sure there are more, but what our group came up with was making ETDs accessible as a standard, so this becomes the norm, evaluation of policy and available resources, and then you adjust as needed, staff training for understanding of terminology and expectations, keeping in mind that this is not a static short-term endeavor, so that long goal in mind over time, the magnitude of the initiative in the short term, and then the student understanding and acceptance. If anyone wants to jump in, otherwise we can move on to questions. 
I think everything that came up in chat has already been directly addressed by someone and then the rest have just been comments. If uh, you wanna type in some more questions or unmute at this time as um, attendees, feel free to ask questions that way too. Or, you know, we're also willing to have a bigger discussion if people also want to jump in and share their own uh, local experiences. Yes, Tim. <laughs> yeah, just wanted to say kind of what Natalie mentioned earlier about um, the students learning from each other. You know, one thing we've been pretty good at, I know Natalie said they had some pushback, but we've really not had much pushback. Uh, and you think about, you know, again, our, the volume, uh, the faculty, have not, I don't know if they know what's going on or not. <laughs> because we've not heard from them at all. Um, but the, the students, um, um, you know, I think I've been pretty impressed with their desire to want to do this um, and, uh, you know, how they um, do kind of help each other, I think, a little bit. And we've even had students that, you know, we are not requiring them to submit the accessibility checker, you know, that it's clean. Uh, when they do their Ohio link submission to us, but we've had students that have done that. They've, they've attached it as a, as a supplemental file. So I think that's really a good sign, uh, you know, that I, I think that the, the students are, you know, really trying to, to incorporate this. And, um, and again, given our numbers, we've had really no pushback whatsoever. Nobody's has come to me and said, why are we doing this uh, kind of thing? So, so I think it's, uh, you know, great that the, you know, we gotta gotta remember that maybe the students will will take to this uh, a little bit, you know, better than we we might initially think. Is you know, just given all the issues. So I'm going to emphasize that to the the Kent State, even the person who came to me in tears because they were so freaked out about their dissertation. Um, she was like, well, I see the importance of doing accessibility. I'm just really, I'm hoping that this doesn't prevent me from graduating. You know, she re even said that. I didn't prompt her. She said it. So I think everybody realizes the importance and that's really good. I think probably the people with the biggest pushback may have been the gatekeepers, but it wasn't a pushback of why are we doing this? It was more of a pushback of fear. Am I capable of learning this? And I promise We'll get you through it. You know, we had a lot of um, trainings and meetings and, and support there for everybody. So I'm happy it's worked out the way it has. Does anybody have any questions? Well, while we're waiting for some to come in, we have two more minutes left to our session. Um, oh, Kim, you wanna leave the contact information oh. up? <laughs> we have our uh, email addresses. Feel free to reach out to any of us um, as, as desired. Uh, also just a plug for the next session. Uh, we have a little bit of a break and then at 3.15 is session four piloting an asynchronous ETD pre-check serving off campus and the time poor. Thank you for the thanks in the chat, everyone. I just wanna thank each of you that were willing to participate in this panel. Um, you guys are great to work with and I really appreciate it.